All right. Uh, I mentioned it to uh, some of you that were sitting over here. Uh, those of you who are sitting in the back, like, I don't know how you can even see me. Like, I'm not that big to start with. <laughs> so, uh, hey, take your chances. If later on, you're going to be like, yeah, he seemed all right, but I have no idea what that guy looks like. Uh, anyway, thank you for coming. Uh, just real quick, I would like, I would like to see uh, how many of you uh, are club or high school coaches primarily. All right, thank you. Uh, how many of you are uh, coaching in college, not in, in NCAA division? All right, a few of those. Uh, NCAA Division II, NCAA Division III, NCAA Division I. All right, cool. So we have a, a nice mixed bag. Thank you very much for, for letting me know that. Um, this is definitely applicable across all of those levels. And the reason why that's applicable to all of those levels is that ultimately we're talking about relationships, we're talking about communication. And we're all people. And we all have certain ways that we communicate and certain pitfalls that we, that we tend to fall into. And so that's what we're here to talk about. If I just talked about numbers, they wouldn't give me a room this big. Uh, but once we bring in the feelings part of it, then it becomes a lot more, uh, a lot more broadly applicable. So uh, one of the things I'm sure that you're aware of is that uh, there are feelings involved, in, just in general. But numbers have a way of bringing that out. And so in keeping with that idea, I want to share one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite quotations about statistics. I shall try not to use statistics as a drunken man uses lampposts for support rather than illumination. Uh, one of the things I tell my boss at, at Colorado is that I am your walking confirmation bias. Uh, meaning that uh, if there is a story that you want to tell yourself about the numbers that I generate, then you can create that story, and then you can look for numbers that will support that. That I, I will end up confirming the things that you believe. In this example, that's using, that's using me to support your position rather than to illuminate it. What I'm interested in here is rather than us being the ones telling the story, what if we let the stats tell us what the story should be? As an example, just blind resumes, super blind. Zero context. I've got two attackers. One of them hits 200. Currently, in the match that we are in right now, I've got an attacker that's hitting 200. I've got an attacker that's hitting 225. I'm going to put you on the spot here, Bobby. Who would you rather have coming into the front row towards the end of a close set? Uh, tell me a little bit about why. Okay, right? So how many, of you guys, how many of you are on board with that? Like, I'll take the 225 right now just because it's better. How many of you would do something different? How many of you have two broken arms? <laughs> Sweet. Uh, I'm not sure how you raised them, but well done, sir. Well done. Uh, so you can come up with reasons for taking the 225 hitter. You can come up with reasons for taking the 200 hitter. I'm giving you no context whatsoever. So in that case, hey, is 225 better than 200? Eh, maybe. So, uh, Casey, I'll put you on the spot for a second. Can you give me a scenario, can you give some context to these numbers where you would rather have that 200 hitter coming into the front row instead of the 225 hitter? Yeah, historical performance would be part of it, and maybe yeah. situational, uh, they're against the specific blockers. Yeah, sure, right? So like I said, we can come up with stories that will support us in either direction. What if I told you that the 225 hitter was a middle and the 200 hitter was an outside? You still want that middle coming into the front row? Or would you rather have the 200 outside hitter? Right, like there's a lot of different ways that we can talk about this. What if that 225 hitter normally hits, or she's hitting 100 for the season? 
and that 200 hitter normally hits 250. How does that influence what you're going to do? So the context around the numbers that we, that we deal with are very important. And very often, we forget that that context exists. We think that it's just plain and simple. You're hitting 200, you're hitting 225, I like you better. But it isn't that simple. And we forget that we are taking into account all of that context. All that context exists, and we are using it whether we realize it or not. And so what I want us to do is to recognize that that context is there. I want us to put a name to it. I want us to be able to address it internally as well as externally. And so that entails, there are three conversations that go on. The first part of this, the first conversation that we have around stats, is the conversation that we just talked about. The one between me as a coach and the stats. I want to know, what is that number telling me? When I'm looking at those attack efficiencies, what are those numbers telling me about those players? What are, they, what are they telling me about my team? What are they telling me about our chances to win? And then very quickly, I move into, what am I telling myself as a result? We are storytellers. People are storytellers. And so I very quickly start telling myself a story about these numbers. And oftentimes, I move out of what are the numbers telling me into what am I telling myself without even realizing it. Look back at when I put those numbers up. Look back at your own internal dialogue for a second. Did you at any point start talking about, I need to get that player off the floor if she's a man. I don't want her on the floor. Right? How many of you are thinking about other things that could come up in these situations? That's the story that you are shaping for yourself. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. It's part of who we are, and it's an important part of who we are. But I want us to recognize that these things happen. I want us to recognize that these are things that we do. We are telling ourselves stories. I want us to recognize that we are doing that so that we can do a better job of shaping those stories. A lot of words, but they're really good. Evaluations are always, in some respect, comparisons, implicitly or explicitly, against others or against a particular set of standards. And some evaluations contain judgments that go beyond the assessment itself. And it is this bullwhip of negative judgment from ourselves or others that produces much of our anxiety around feedback. Real quick side note, this comes from a book called Thanks for the Feedback. I highly, highly recommend this book. And it is the bullwhip of negative judgment that produces much of our anxiety around Every time we talk about stats, every time we talk about numbers, and other conversations as well, we invite judgment to happen. We invite it, both on our side, but also on the side of the people that we're talking to. Whether it be our athletes, our other coaches on our staff, our administration. When we start talking about these, these evaluations, because that's ultimately what the numbers are. The numbers are evaluations. We invite judgment. And when we invite judgment, we invite the opportunity for negative judgment. And that negative judgment creates a lot of anxiety. So here's a thought that I want you to hold on to, because we'll be coming back to this idea. And that is, how do we reduce that anxiety? How do we reduce the stress around these conversations and ultimately around the numbers that we're talking about. Here's another example. I got two teams. One team's 18 and 12. One team's 12 and 18. So 
which head coach is feeling more pressure? Again, zero context, that's the idea. Just want to look at the numbers. Your turn to be on the spot. Talk to you. Which one of those do you think has a little more pressure involved? They're losing. Can you give me a scenario where that coach probably isn't feeling the, the same kind of pressure that we just thought about? Yeah, started out 0 18, finished 12 and 18. Like, hey, I'm still not really crazy about the first 18 matches, but it could have been 0 and 30, I guess, right? Yeah, thank you. I could appreciate that. So, again, I can put some context on that where all of a sudden that 12 and 18 is looking a little bit better. Kyle, your turn. Coffee, I'm so glad you guys were game tags. This is so much fun. Uh, talk to me, that 18 and 12 team, what kind of a scenario would there be where that 18 and 12 coach is feeling more pressure than the 12 and 18 coach? Maybe they lost a couple in a row, they're like, they lost the other conference tournament, and like that. Yeah, I love it, right? Uh, I think that, uh, a, a great example that, that worked out pretty well this year. Um, friends of mine, I used to work there at the University of Denver uh, in, in Division I. Um, they lost one match uh, in the regular season uh, to another tournament team, and then they lost in the conference final in basically a one-bid conference. And they were so on the bubble, so stressed out about being able to get into the tournament. Yeah, sure, that's a team that's 27 and 1 instead of 18 and 12. But what if you're that 18 and 12 team in the one bid conference and you just and that 12th loss was in the conference final? And all of a sudden you don't have anything to do the first weekend in December, but go home and do laundry. Right? So now that's that's a little bit of a different scenario. But again, it takes that context and we start telling ourselves some stories. So those stories, like I said, though, those are stories that we tell ourselves, and they're stories also that we tell to others. Let's think about it. If I'm that 18 and 12 coach, and I have to go, uh, I have to go have a meeting with my administration and talk about maybe hey, we just lost in the conference finals, and we've been to the NCAA tournament the last four years running, and now we're not. How am I? What, what's the con what, what do I think that conversation is going to be like? Right? All, all of a sudden now, uh, that 18 12 coach is feeling the pressure. I'm, I'm trying to figure out what, how, how do I make this okay? I think 18 and 12 is bad, right? But maybe the expectations in your program are a little bit different than that. Right? So what do I do with that? Remember I talked about that whole whip of negative judgment? You feeling that right now? What am I supposed to do when I go talk to my administration about this? What if I'm in a contract here? How about if I'm a club coach and that 18 and 12 comes from a 17-1 team that should be uh, that should be in the gold, that should be in the gold bracket qualifiers? What are my parents saying? How long until I start getting phone calls, having to sit down and meet meetings, and trying to explain it? Right? There's, there's a lot of room here for stories to be told. There's a lot of room here for anxiety. So I want to I want to talk about the second of our three conversations, and that is the conversation between the athlete and the stats. Could also be between parents and administrators, but ultimately, typically, the conversations that we're going to have are going to be around uh, around stats directly with our athletes. They have the same things going on as we do. Those stats are telling them something, and those stats, then, as a result, are are, are rather we are saying they are saying something to themselves about those stats. They're telling themselves stories. And here's where it starts to get a little bit scarier, right? Because do they know stats as well as we do? Right? Probably not. It's my job to be really good with the numbers. That's what I get paid for. So if I'm going to have a conversation with you about stats, 
I'm, I probably shouldn't expect you to be in the same place as me. And that's okay. Nothing wrong with that. It's not saying that you're bad at your job. This is, this is my area of expertise, right? So I need to be sensitive to that. I need to be aware that the people that I am talking to are coming from a different place. That may be a place of less experience, of less knowledge. It might not be. But even if it is uh, a place of less or equal or more knowledge, it is a different place than the one I'm coming from. And that's something that I need to be paying attention to. And that's why it's a conversation. Because I don't know what your experience is. I don't know what your history is. I don't know what your background is. So if I want to have a meaningful conversation with you, I should probably be paying attention to that. I should probably be paying attention to the conversation that you're having with the staff to see how that fits in with the conversation I'm having. Just as an example, language is really complicated. Language is really hard. If I say to you, close your eyes and picture a house. The house that you are imagining might not be the house that I'm imagining. Right? You need more water? I'll come back. Sure. Okay, I'm getting it. But so tell me, I say house to you. Quick picture. What does that house look like? What else I live? Okay. Two stories, 50 feet wide, 40 feet high. Awesome. Great. Yeah, I was thinking of a gingerbread house. <laughs> yeah, not, not the same. I fit in one, though, um, so it's okay. Right, so, but that's, that's the thing, right? We can have such markedly different descriptions of what a house is. Right? I could have been thinking about the end zone, because I take it to the house. Right? Yeah, that was awful. <laughs> don't, don't, yeah, just don't. Right? There are many different ways I can describe that house. There's many different ways that you can. Right? I can, for all of you that are in here, I, could pro I probably have about that many different answers for what that house might look like. So the conversations that you're having and the conversations that I'm having are different. The stories that you're telling and the stories that I'm telling are different. How do I figure that out? Let's, let's, take, a look, let's take a look at something else. Again, zero context. It's so much more fun that way. Oh, it's your turn. What's a perfect set look like? Describe it. Come on, lean in, Dana. Go for it. Um, four ball to the outside. Four ball to the outside. Tell me a little bit more. What's the shape of it look like? What's the tempo? Uh, second tempo. Not too high. Not too high. Okay. Thanks, Old <laughs> Boss. Just right. <laughs> Just right. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm a middle, so I really don't want to hit that set. No, I really am a middle. Okay. Uh, right, so there's nothing wrong with that description of a perfect set. That, that set's perfect for what you had in mind. You're thinking of an outside set. I'm thinking of a middle set. Your description of a set is not going to be perfect for, for what I'm picturing. Okay, that's because I was talking about a middle set. Right? Nothing wrong with that. Your description is fine for the offense that you run, for the team that you have. But I'm not bothering to learn any of that, am I? I'm just like, that sounds like an awful set. Right? It sounds like an awful set because I'm in the middle and I want to hit first tempo and I want to hit in the middle zone of the net. So, how do I figure out what your perfect set looks like? And then have I bothered to figure out what my perfect set looks like so that we can start preparing? So is just listening to Dana tell her version of a perfect set, is that the best way to figure out what my perfect set is? What is there to be learned from both sides? What is there to be learned from me hearing about your perfect set and you, in turn, hearing about mine. And that's the third conversation. The third conversation is the one between the two humans. 
If I want to talk to my athlete about the stats, then I need to start talking with them rather than talking at them. That's the only way I'm going to bridge that gap. Uh, a lot of times, I think if we are, uh, if, if we're not paying attention, if we're not really, uh, if we feel like we don't have time, etc., rather than bridge the gap, we're trying to grab that athlete and pull them across the gap and just tell them, this is what it is. And I'm not saying that, that you're wrong about what it is. But what I am saying is that if they don't understand how to get from where they are to where you are, that it's not going to matter how right you are. If their idea of a perfect set is different than your idea of a perfect set, they are going to need to come around to your idea of a perfect set if they want to get the ball. But it is, it is the work to get them to come around, to get them to understand. That work is crucial, and that's ultimately what we're talking about. Right, so we're, we have to recognize that there's context to these numbers. We have to recognize that there are stories being told by ourselves as well as by the athletes. Now we need to be respectful of that fact. We need to be aware that those stories are being told internally or externally, and we need to address them. And that's why I say that the main goal of these conversations with athletes about stats the main goal should be about increasing understanding. And that increasing of understanding is just as much about increasing understanding of each other as it is about increasing understanding of the staff we're talking about. Because we're making all of these assumptions, we're telling ourselves all of these stories underneath all of this, we need to recognize that. That is the first part. That is the first and most important thing. And that brings us to shared vision. Shared vision means we both nod and want to work together on it. Probably have heard of that guy. Shared vision is ultimately what we're going for. That common understanding of what we are talking about. And vision also has a connotation that goes far beyond understanding. Vision starts talking about where we want to go. Vision starts talking about the future. It starts talking about expectations. It starts talking about goals. But here's the thing, is that when we start having conversations, this is usually what they look like. I got one person talking squares, another person talking circles. And if we're not bringing up the fact that you're speaking a little bit different language because you have a different story than I do, then we're just going to keep talking past one another. And if we keep talking past one another, then we're not sharing anything. We're not creating a common anything. And that's ultimately what we're driving for. And that takes work, right? Sharing means actually sharing. Right? It, does, it doesn't mean you, you, you take what I tell you because I'm in charge. Right? And there's, there's a lot more nuance to that. There's a lot more nuance to that that we're coming to. But ultimately, I want you to recognize that if we're going to get past this, we got to work for it. This is what we're going for. Instead of talking past one another, instead of not having any, any mixing of our ideas, this is what we're shooting for. Where the stuff that I'm talking about and the stuff that you're talking about meet in the middle. 
and we're able to start blending those ideas together so that we have a common understanding. I am not saying that we should incorporate all of our players' ideas when we sit down and talk to them. That is not what I'm getting at. What I'm getting at here is that I need to do the work <coughs> to uncover the story that that athlete is telling himself, telling herself. I need to make that explicit. I need to make the story that I'm telling explicit. So we're not, we're not talking about like, oh, I'm gonna change my mind about this or you're gonna change your mind. At this point, all I'm talking about is how do you see this? Here's how I see it. Now let's make sure that you understand how I'm seeing it. Let's make sure that I understand how you're seeing it. So let's begin at the beginning. Oh, I'm going to follow you. This is why I have a wireless microphone. I'm asking you a question. Okay, great. Yeah, okay. So great. You're, you're here, so zero, zero context is going to be great. Uh, so we're going to begin at the beginning. When I am faced with facts that don't fit in with my self-image, right? Can you think of an example of a time like when somebody told you something that just felt untrue to you? Yes, I am. You are, you are correct. Yeah, thank you. No, still short. Still short. You are right. So what's, what's going to be a response to somebody like that? How would you feel if, when somebody does something like that to you? So there's some work involved for, for me internally to figure out what that means, right? Is that work comfortable or easy all the time? <laughs> Why not? I think because it's, I guess, well, first of all, there's a lot going on in our lives, so like, having to deal with negative self-talk and things going in our brains, like, it takes a lot of energy. So, and then trying to move into whatever solution, whether you agree with that person's head or not agree with that person's head, so it's just a lot of, Brain time and operant energy. Yes, I I totally agree. With that. Thank you so much. Please have a seat. Take the back, my Stay a while. Uh, I I love that. Right? It, it takes work internally, right? And that happens for all of us. It happens to our athletes. It happens to our administrators. It happens for all of us because we're people, and this is how we respond to these situations. So when the stats tell me something that I don't agree with, something that I know is true, you know, if I if I have this one kid that I, I just think you're hey, you're a really average passer, and she's churning out numbers that say that says she's above average or below average, how easy is it for me to do that work that you're talking about to reconcile those differences? That's what we're talking about, is that work. How are we doing that work? Or are we doing that work? The people that we're talking to, we're putting them in positions to feel this sort of anxiety, this, this bullwhip of negative judgment. We're inviting these conversations to happen. We are going to tell our athletes things that they are uncomfortable with. Whether it be because they are very self-effacing and we're telling them that they're better, that they are executing at a level higher than they think they are. Or maybe we have a kid that is just dead medium. And she really thinks that she's better than dead medium because there's nobody better than her on your bench that you can sub in for her. I'm gonna to have to tell both of those athletes things that are going to make them uncomfortable. So remember I asked you to hold on to a thought. How do I decrease that anxiety around evaluation? 
I can't use stats to just allow me to say that that passer is good or bad. That's a judgment. Judgments are about people. Evaluations are about performances. Come on in, come on. You better hurry or I'm going to ask you a question. Right, Jordan? There you go. Don't worry, I'll find you. Uh, right? I'm asking them to evaluate rather than judge. But the movement from evaluation into judgment happens so seamlessly that it's almost invisible. So we got to recognize that. We got to do something about it. I mentioned before, shared vision, shared vision means sharing. How do I understand the situation? How do you understand the situation? The way that I go about doing this is I ask a ton of questions. My conversations with athletes are usually prefaced with a whole lot of me asking a short question and then dragging out long responses. Because what I'm going for is working to understand where they are coming from. I'm trying to understand their story. And a lot of athletes, especially when they're younger, but maybe this still happens even as they get older, because again, we're all humans. We all function this way. And unless we get good at this, unless we start paying attention to really doing work on this, we probably haven't developed a lot of skills in communicating and learning about how communication works. But hey, that's why we're here, right? So, here's the kind of thing I'm talking about, right? I'm gonna focus this Oh, you're hiding the name tag. Oh, that makes it tough. All right, so, I, I, wanna, I wanna give you an example of what I've been talking about. All right, so when I say shared vision means share, right? Tell me what that means to you. How are you interpreting what I'm saying right there? Give it to me in other words. I asked you the question, where are you asking the question? Yeah, yeah, just give that to me in another way. In a way that makes sense to you. Okay, well, I would find a way to explain it in a way that you can understand it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, I, I get it. I hear what you're saying. Right? So that, that's a, one way I could one way I could go about that. So how about I'm gonna go back to this one for a second. And uh, I got the square, the square guy and the circle guy over here. How do you interpret that image? What does that image look like to you? Difference of opinion, tell me more about what that means. I mean, I'm not seeing things a different way than the players are, but I'm seeing a different aspect. I guess the point of view that they are, because they're seeing from the play. I just want to know what you mean. That, that's ultimately what I'm getting at. But, but yeah, but this is this is the kind of work that I'm talking about. Right? I started asking, well, how are you interpreting that? Because I know what I'm taking away from. But that isn't necessarily what you take away from it. Like I said, language is hard. Language is complicated. Right? And so when I just take pictures and there's no words at all, now we can really run far afield. That can mean a whole lot of different things. Right? So I'm going to take this next picture. Right? Tell me, what do you see here? What, what does this picture represent for you? Clarifying expectations. All right, clarifying expectations. Uh, tell me more. Give me an example. Okay. So what I'm what I'm hearing you say is that you're you're taking you're taking that idea and, and putting it onto specific examples or, or different scenarios. Like I could be having this this type of interaction with a player, or I could have a, that kind of type of interaction with my administration. Uh, is that an accurate description? Yeah. Okay. That's that's what I'm talking about. I'm asking him, well, what does that mean to you? And then I'm taking what he's telling me, and I'm feeding it back to him. And then I'm, I'm asking him, okay, so does that, does that sound right? Does that match what you meant to describe? Right? And, and so again, when we start talking about things like stats, 
then we start talking about things that they're uncomfortable with, not just because they might not know about them, but because they are describing their performances too. And so I've got to have those kind of conversations about the numbers. So if I go back to that 200 and 225 hitter example, and I'm, I'm, I need to talk to those hitters about their performances. So what does it mean for you to be hitting 200? Uh, um, yeah, they might not know. So you're probably going to have to give them a lot of the context, and that's fine. That's that's a lot of what we're doing. Right? We. This is where I, I want you. To, I want you to understand that these conversations aren't just about like I'm. I'm going to be like everybody's worst stereotype of a player's coach. You know, where I, I just want everybody to feel good. I want everybody to be happy. We're going to roll the balls out, and then when practice is over, ice cream shows up. Right? Like, that's not what I'm getting at. We're not, I'm not talking about coddling them in these conversations. I'm talking about teaching. I'm talking about interacting. I'm talking about understanding. I'm talking about us helping them learn more about the game, learn more about themselves. And they're going to learn more about me, and they're going to learn more about how we all interact. Hey, uh, I'm pretty sure that helping our athletes better interact with their superiors is a good thing. I'm pretty sure that we're going to create a lot more functional grown-ups the better we are at that. Right, so one of the things that gets hard about that is that once we start talking about stats, and I, and I help you understand what it means to be a 200 hitter, hey, you know what, you're a 200 hitter, but I believe that you can be better than that. And here's how we're going to go about doing that. This is where it gets hard. This is where we really start to smooth over that anxiety. This is how we start smoothing over that anxiety. We get them out of judging their performances when we get them to come with us on the idea that you're hitting 200 right now, but I believe that you can hit 250. And you hitting 250 would mean this for our team. Right? So, moving forward never straight. Uh, that, that idea of forward never straight, it, it's, uh, it's a fun idea that I stole from somewhere else. The, the website is down there. It's called WeDo.Team. Um, it's got nothing to do with volleyball, uh, just so you're aware. Uh, but uh, the idea is that getting from 200 to 250 is hard. It's hard because it's uncomfortable. It's hard because we're, we're trying to break new ground. But that's one of the great things is that about stats. Is that if we're having these conversations about the stats, then we can start using those stats a lot more often to track that progress. Are we moving forward? I hope we're moving forward. But here's the thing, is that when we're moving forward, we're not necessarily moving straight. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that uh, learning is not pretty. Learning is not linear. Uh, if any of you know who Trevor Reagan is, he'll be presenting in this room tomorrow afternoon. He'll tell you all about that. He calls the training ugly. Uh, but that's ultimately what we're talking about, is that our progress is not going to be pretty. It would be cool if it was, but it won't necessarily be. But if I can get my players to see that the stats are an evaluation rather than a judgment, that they are a description of where they are currently, rather than 
who they are, <coughs> then I open up the possibility then for them to improve. I can start talking about, hey, you know what makes you a 200 hitter? I've noticed that most of your errors come on out of system balls. So we're going to take a look at how, we're going to take some time and practice to work on how you make decisions when we go out of system. I think that's the, the first place that we're going to go to help you be a better hitter. So I help them see that it's not just you're a 200 hitter, deal with it. And this kid's hitting 225, so she's going to be on the court and you're not. There's so much more nuance. There's so much more context. And so I've got to talk about that. I've got to address it. And then ultimately, I've got to use that as a way to help them see that they can get better. And I'm going to deepen their competitive understanding. Hey, if we got you from 200 to 250. You know what? It's not going to happen all at once. We're going to work our way there. But as we get better, as you get closer to 250, let's think about what that means. One less error, two more kills in a match. It's not much. It's a small thing. If you make better decisions, let me reframe that question or that statement. If I can help you make some different decisions out of system, <coughs> then we can make it easier to prevent those errors. Hey, let's not, maybe, maybe we shouldn't just go up and swing away 100% on that ball that's set at eight feet that you're jumping backwards for. Right, like, hey, there's ways I can frame that that are really negative, and there are ways that I can frame that that are much more positive. Right, but ultimately, what I want them to see is, hey, you know what? I can help, I can help you eliminate that error pretty easily. Let's back off of that ball when you're off balance. Let's just put it in play, right? And then we can create some opportunities in practice for you to do that. <coughs> All of a sudden, now that error goes away, and we're a step closer to 250. How do I get a couple more kills? Hey, you know what? You're taking some pretty good looks and just grooving that ball into six. And that becomes an in-system in ball in transition for our opponents. If we take that ball and groove it into one, you're probably going to score a little bit more, right? I haven't, I haven't made you, I haven't made you a harder hitter. All I've done is say, hey, hit that same shot this way. Cool. Let's work on that. I've now gotten you one kill closer to being 250. I've increased your competitive understanding by saying. That ball that you're hitting is giving our opponents a point. This ball that you could hit, that's in your skill set, would become more of a wash, or might give us a better chance. That's competitive understanding. I can, get, I can improve your performance. Hey, you know what? I think you can hit that same shot harder. I think you can hit that same shot against a well-formed block. And I, I, I think you should go for it more often, right? I, I, think you're, I, I think you've got that in you, right? That's still stuff that's in your skill set. I'm just working hard to bring it out of you. And I've used the stats to show you what that would mean for us. <coughs> if my performance was, in, was inadequate, what caused it to be that way and how do we change that process? That's what I've just been describing. This is what I've noticed about you, my little 200 hitter. And this is how I see room for improvement. Because again, this is ultimately what allows us to move out of anxiety, to move out of judgment, and into evaluation. These numbers are telling me something. Here's what they're telling me. And here's what I see. Do you see that? Yeah, you remember, hey, you remember that one ball that you took? Hey, it was 13-13. Second set, don't worry. We won't make it that high pressure. Remember that, remember that ball, 13-13? Uh, out of system, 
you were like you were you were ready to take a good approach, and then all of a sudden that ball was set on top of you, and so you freaked out and, and just gave a free ball. You remember that? A lot of times, if I paint that picture, they'll be like, "Oh yeah, yeah, I totally remember that." Cool. Let's think about how we can do how we can manage that situation differently. Now it's not. It, my athlete isn't feeling like, oh, I did something dumb, didn't I? Like, we've skipped right on past that and into, here's, here's how we can make that better. That's how we avoid that bull whip of negative judgment. That's how we move forward, even if it's not straight. Sometimes she's going to jump up and whack that ball, and it's not going to work out. But eventually, we're going to grow that to be part of her skill set if we recognize that that is a point for her to improve. So what this also means is that I don't get to have this conversation once with my 200 hitter. I got to have it a whole bunch of times. And that doesn't mean it's got to be a sit-down meeting and it's got to take a long time, but it is a conversation. It's a conversation that I am going to keep going. And I'm going to keep it going by saying that the numbers are not a, they are not a final word. They're a starting word. Right? The, if I treat the numbers as a final word, that's me saying, you're a 200 hitter, come have a seat next to me, make room for a little Miss 225. That's a, that, that is where, where there is no discussion. That's the final word. If I want to have a start, if I want to have a discussion, then the numbers are that starting point. You're hitting 200. Yeah, sure, she's hitting 225. Let's talk about you. You're hitting 200. You want to hit 225? Okay, let's talk about how. And so, great, I have that conversation with her once. We go have practice. And she's not a 225 hitter yet. She certainly isn't a 250 hitter yet. So I'm going to have to come back to that. Sometimes i got to say the same stuff. Hey, remember we talked about you giving a free ball on that out-of-system stuff? You're still doing it, yeah? Uh, okay, tell me about that. What, like, let's go back to that 13-13 situation. You saw that ball, you gave... Uh, you saw that set get put on top of you, and you gave a free ball. Tell me what you saw. This goes back to the stories that we're telling ourselves. I need to understand her story. What did you see? What were you thinking about that led, that led you to make that choice instead of taking a chance on, on hitting that ball? Your turn. You're going to be my 200 hitter. They've got that ball set on top of you. So tell me, like, what? Go ahead and draw that. Create that scenario in your mind for a second. And I want you to think about what would cause you to, rather than jump up and whack at that ball at 13 13 and set two, to just give a free ball instead? How, what, what could be happening for you? Uh, worried about making an error. All right, worried about making an error. That's if, if we were playing Family Feud, I'm pretty sure that's number one on the board, right? Give me, give me another reason. What, what else you got in there? Uh, All right, sure. The set wouldn't have been on top of me if I would have waited, right? Let's go back to that perfect set you described for me, right? Hey, that was a perfect set. You were early. Right? Yeah, that, that could be it. Right? So now, you're, let's, let's go with that scenario. So you're, uh, you know what? I gave that because I was early. Okay, cool. Let's talk more about that. Uh, did you uh, was the set was the set the right tempo? Yes. Okay, set was the right tempo, and did did she just miss it off the net? No. Okay, so let's talk. So it really comes down. It's more about your approach. Do you think so? Yes. Okay. So what do we what what do you want to change about your approach so that we can put you in a better position for that set? Okay, so does that mean that you don't think you were on the right step when the ball uh, when the ball was in our center stand? Correct. Okay, so that's the thing we want to look for. So it might be a little bit less about decision making now that I've had this conversation. It might be a little bit more about timing. It might be a little bit more about recognizing that oh, you know what? I'm early, and I do that I do that more than once. Like this is not a unique thing. 
Right? Thank you. Right? So that's what I'm talking about. Keep that conversation going. I've already talked to you about like, hey, I really want you to hit 250. That was an example of how I can get you from 200 to 250. And by having that conversation, I now see that it's not about your decision making. You should have jumped up and, and hit that ball. It's more about, oh, you know what? The issue that you're having is timing. And hey, you know what? Maybe if I'm if I'm a uh, if I'm a different coach, maybe I already knew that. I probably already knew that. But the great thing is, now he knows that I know that, and I know that he knows that. And that's that shared vision. <coughs> that's that common understanding. And so now we've got a clear path that we can draw. Hey, we're going to work on your timing. We're gonna we're gonna start looking at that when we get into practice and we're and we're doing some hitting. I'm gonna give you a bunch of feedback on your on your timing. How's that sound? Yeah, cool, great. Shared vision. Now, it's not gonna be linear. It's gonna be ugly sometimes. When we're working on that when we're working on that timing, sometimes you're gonna nail it, and I'm gonna be like. That's it. Feel that? That's what we're going for. Yes, nice job. Cool. Let's do it again. That was not it. That was not it. Okay. Um, but I'm not going to, I have to not do that because that's judging, right? But I've got to accept that. I've got to recognize just as much as my athlete does that, hey, you got it this time. That does, definitely does not mean you're going to get it next time. Okay, hey, you were late on that one. Did you feel that? What did you think? Did you, did you feel like you were late? No, I, I felt like I was on time. All right, let's have a little discussion again about what on time is. We keep that conversation going, and we help them understand, hey, that's great. You got it last time. Remember that feeling? Okay, let's go try and create that feeling again. Okay, you repped it again. How'd that feel? Did it, feel, did it feel like that other one? No? Okay, what was different about it? Okay, so what do you want to do differently on this next one? Okay, go. Right? We understand then that as they're going through that process, as they are dealing with this, I got it this time, I didn't get it that time, but I got it the other time, and then, then I got it the time after that, and then we're going to start saying, well, hey, when we start doing those things more consistently, or less consistently, what are the numbers going to look like? Hey, remember, remember we said we were trying to get from 200 to 250? Okay. That last match, you hit 175. Let's talk about what created that. Okay. How was your timing? You know what? I thought my timing was pretty good. Okay. Great. That's a good improvement. Yeah, but I thought my decision making was really poor. Okay, that's that may be. Let's go back to your timing. That's what we've been paying attention to, right? So let's keep paying attention to that. Let's keep working on getting better at your timing. Because the better your timing gets, the easier it's going to be for you to then start thinking about your decision making again. Right? Be okay with that. Be okay with it being a little ugly, it being uncomfortable, with there being more failure, because we're working on something. Okay? That's what we're talking about here. So the more I can make the numbers relatable, the less anxiety there is. The more I can say, oh, you hit 175 that, that match, let's talk about why. Let's talk about what created that the easier it is for that to be about evaluation instead of judgment. And when I create more evaluation and less judgment, then I create less anxiety and more knowledge. I can show the athletes there's a connection between the stats they're generating and the success of the team. Hey, yeah, it feels good if you're a 250 hitter, but let's talk about what that means in the context of our whole team. It means you're making fewer errors. That means you're putting more pressure on your opponent, right? So now like, their game's starting to break down. And all of a sudden, things are getting easier for the rest of our team just because you learned to groove the ball into zone one instead of grooving it into zone six. 
show them the different levels of execution can either increase or decrease the amount of pressure on a different skill in keeping with that attacking. So, hey, you know what? So you hit one, you're hit you hitting 175 in this match. Ooh, that's a bummer. You keep focusing on your timing. We're going to get better. We're going to make this better. Right? Meanwhile, hey, if you're hitting 175, that's okay. We can still win. We can still win with you hitting 175. Hey, let's just... We need, to, we need to create a few more out-of-system opportunities for our opponents. That means, hey, let's serve a little bit tougher. Let's be really on top of our jobs on defense. Because that, that's going to take some of that pressure off of you attacking. All right. All of this sounds like work. Because it is. You don't have to. You don't have to. Thank you so much for coming here. I'm really, really excited to have to be able to share this with you. You can walk out of here and not do anything with it. All of you that have been writing down notes can take them outside and burn them. That's up to you. You don't have to incorporate any of this. If you don't, in my opinion, we are limiting what our athletes can do, what our athletes can think, what our athletes can be. Maybe we're not specifically putting them in a box, but we're giving them permission to put themselves in that box. We are allowing them to make themselves smaller. And I don't think that's what we're after. You can walk out of here and forget everything we talked about. And you can rely on extrinsic motivation. The stat said you hit 200. The stat said she hit 250. Have a seat next to me because she's going to go play. The numbers say you are or are not good enough already. We can promote fixed mindsets. You're a 200 hitter. That's just what you are. This girl is just a 250 hitter, so she's a starter. We can shift our focus from the athlete to the coach. That's what we're doing. Because ultimately what we're saying is, you need to execute at this level. If you're not going to hit 250, I'm going to like her better than you. <coughs> or, you can work to incorporate these things into how you interact with your athlete. That means we, we ask questions, and we actively listen to responses. <laughs> Feed that back to me. Is that accurate? Do I understand what you're saying correctly? Doing those things is going to help them feel more autonomous. It's going to make them feel more confident. If I can help them feel more autonomous, that means that I help them feel like they are in control of themselves that they are in control of what they are doing and who they are becoming. I make those conversations, I make those meetings or, or any, any talk I have with my players, I make it worth their energy and their attention because I engage them. Because I listen to them and they listen to me and they see that I am incorporating what they are telling me. All of a sudden, my athletes aren't tuning me out. They're not all the time. You guys can't even see that up there, can you? That's all right, don't worry. I'll do it for you later if you want. Um, I make those conversations worthy of their attention, worthy of their energy. Not because I'm saying something super important, but because I'm including them. And ultimately, those things are going to increase motivation. They're going to increase. Uh, they're going to increase their activation, their interest in being a part of what's happening. So much of leadership ability is about how other people experience themselves in your presence. A great leader has a presence that makes other people 
How do you want your athletes to feel in your presence? So, if you're going to walk out of here and you're not going to burn your notes, then what can you do to start working on this? What can you do to start creating these sorts, these sorts of environments? I got three ideas for you. First one. Going back to our first conversation between us and the stats, take a look at the match stats tonight. I'm sure they're going to have something up on the board that we can that we can look at stat-wise. Or maybe maybe you're one of those people that's got like the, the live stats pulled up on your phone. Yeah, I'm that guy. Uh, take a look at a stat, any of them, and start thinking about what's that conversation that I'm having with myself. What is this number telling me? And what am I telling myself as a result? Well, that kid's having a really good night tonight. Wow, that's a whole lot of context built into that that I just skipped right over. Why do I think she's having a good night? Oh, because I've looked at her stats for the year and I know what her attack efficiency is. And she is hitting 50 points better than that right now. Wow, I hope she can keep that going. Right, again, all that context, all of that context, Start making that explicit. Start articulating that. Pick a stat and start listening to that voice in your head. Pick an innocent bystander. Chances are you got tickets next to somebody you don't know. Pick a stat and ask them what they think of it. And listen. Listen. Listen for the story that they are telling themselves because that's the story they're going to start telling you. Don't ask them about the stats so you can tell them what you think. Ask them about the stats so you can understand what they think. And then the last one, when you're staring at your hotel ceiling tonight, start thinking through a conversation you have with an athlete or an administrator or a coach where you could incorporate ways of sharing vision, ways where you could create better understanding on either side. How can I understand better the story that they're telling? How can I understand better the story that I'm telling? Just remember, if you're going to burn your notes after this, uh, it's a no-smoking facility, so you have to go outside for your day. Thank you so much. Uh, my content information is here.